Okay, 13.2 talks about the equation of motion, and this is going to come from any time we have a set of forces. So some force one, some force two maybe, and that's going to lead to some acceleration. They're not necessarily the same length because this needs a scalar mass multiplier in front, but we can take a free body diagram. So if we had a mass with these forces acting on it, F1 and F2, we can say that the addition of these vectors, tip to tail, gives us what we can call the resultant force. And that'll be the summation of our forces and vector sign, vector sign, vector sign, vector sign, vector sign. Okay, um, and this would be called a free body diagram. You should be very familiar with those. The, the difference is these are not gonna equal zero. It's gonna equal, I don't know how that happens every time. It's gonna equal some mass times acceleration, and it's gonna be exactly as long as this in the same direction. So, mass is a scalar and acceleration is a vector, and we call this a kinetic diagram. <clears throat> okay, so this gives us our equation of motion. The equation of motion is when we sum up all those forces, it equals some mass times acceleration, and you'll see in the future and in an analysis of dynamic systems, you'll have things, if you remember the acceleration in the x direction, we can call x double dot, the velocity in the x direction is x dot, and the position would just be x. Well, we can have things like x double dot, a function of x dot, and a function of x, and maybe some constant. These will be only solvable by a differential equation. We're not going to have to worry about those just yet. Um, ours will be a little bit simpler. Um, okay, so one of the most important things when we look at kinematics, or sorry, at kinetics, is that we use an inertial reference frame. What does that mean? So imagine someone standing here. Um, they could be looking at some particle on a path. This reference frame can be moving with some velocity, but it has to be constant. It cannot be accelerating. And so when applying the equation of motion, it's important that the acceleration of the particle be measured with the respect to a reference frame that is either fixed or translates with a constant velocity. And we'll see that we will attach a reference frame to something, I keep bringing these up, but if we have some rigid body AB and at some later time it translated and also rotated, this will be our translating point. So in that case, it translated to that point with some constant velocity. Okay, um, we call this inertial reference frame, you might see it as a Newtonian or inertial reference frame. Um, if we were working with satellites or orbits, we would pick the stars as our inertial reference frame because compared to our solar system, if we look at the stars way out here, they don't move with respect to us much at all. We can pretty much use them to guide ourselves through the solar system. Outside the solar system, we would have to triangulate stars different. Um, and in a more complex method. If we are on the surface of Earth, though, we can consider Earth itself 
a reference frame for most of our cases. So if we have a projectile motion problem, uh, we can almost typically ignore the rotation of Earth and the movement of Earth through space. There is a thing called the Coriolis effect, and I will go over that, and then it does have to do with the rotation of the Earth affecting where the trajectory will land. Um, but in general, we do not need to account for that rotation. Um, real quick note, um, you'll sometimes see the equation of motion, summation of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. If you look in other literature, they'll throw this term on the other side and say the summation of the forces minus the mass times the acceleration is equal to zero. Um, they refer to it as an inertia force vector. Get used to the wording, but I'm not going to be doing that. Um, I believe analysis of dynamic systems will do that, but it'll make sense to you'll have a gigantic mass on rollers or something and it's connected to springs, it's also connected to dampeners, and it might be on top of a mass itself that's allowed to move. Well, we have to consider this mass itself an MA. And when we put everything on the left-hand side, it also makes it easier to set up as a differential equation, and we can solve it. Um, okay, I just wanted to talk about inertia real quick. Um, the best example of this, uh, the book talks about a guy in like a rocket sled He's sitting in here and hauling butt, and basically, you when you floor it in a car, your head gets thrown back. Well, no, that's not exactly what's happening. And uh, Dr. Richard Feynman explained this the best. Uh, his, his he asked his dad when he was a kid why the bowling ball went backwards when he pulled his. Uh, little radio flyer wagon with the bowling ball in the middle and in fact it doesn't if we look at it at some later instance it doesn't go backwards friction actually makes it go forwards just a little bit it's just moved back a little bit from where it started inside the wagon so yes, it does roll backwards, and it or if no if there's friction or no friction, it would just slide backwards and hit the back as you pull it, and that's that's the the phenomenon you're used to seeing. But what's actually happening is it does move forward a little bit. Friction's pulling it forward, and, but with respect to the inertial reference frame of the cart itself it's moving directly backwards if you stood far enough away and viewed this with your eye you would see that it does actually go forward as the cart moves it will move back to the back of the cart over time, but it still moves forward instantaneously. All right, thank you.